and welcome to Virtual Concert Hall's live music channel. My name is Chris Al, and I have with me the co-founder of Virtual Concert Hall's amazing Dr. Anna Ostenskaya. Welcome. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for joining us for the mm -hmm. second episode. I'm so excited. We're going through those episodes one by one, and I hope you stay with us and watch those programs further. Yeah, thank you for participating and watching, and I hope you share with people you know. This is part two of the documentary of Beethoven Symphony No. 1, written and narrated by Lawrence Rapchak, created by New Media Productions Worldwide and Virtual Concert Halls, as well as being produced by Architects of Music. This is an incredible collaboration. I'm really thrilled to be part of it. And it's been made possible by our shared passion to be connecting musicians and audiences in real-time music live programs and performances from around the globe. or Allegro con Brio. Our exposition begins. And so this magnificently structured introduction, which began with such ambivalence and then hovered around C major, has finally settled into that key for the exposition. And Beethoven, child of the Enlightenment and the classical style, would create a first symphony roughly equivalent to late Mozart and Haydn in its overall proportions, its style, and architecture. Moving on now to its textbook exposition. And already, Beethoven is using that Haydn-esque technique of taking tiny motifs or cells and using them to build his structure. So in the first theme of this exposition, he takes three notes. G, the dominant, the B is the leading tone, which results to C, the tonic, bum, 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 and a snappy rhythm to provide energy. And then upward C major triad now, here, with the leading tone, bum, bum, prominent. We move then into D minor, and the same thing repeats, but up a step which now prepares us for a big, emphatic, extended C major episode. So what I'd like to do now is to play for you all of the main themes of the exposition, and then we'll hear them as they occur in the orchestra. First, the main theme in C major. It repeats in D minor, and then leads us back to C major with these dynamic chords. clearly related to those big majestic chords from the introduction. Then the next theme of this group built on a C major triad and a descending scale, like so. Then a transition using the main theme, leading to the key of G major, the all-important dominant or polar key and another theme, also with a descending scale. A connecting theme. Now the secondary group of themes, all in the dominant key of G major, and as required by the sonata form, more lyrical in character, featuring now the woodwinds, like so. And notice, this theme is also built on a descending scale. These scales are everywhere, here, and even the main theme. Plus, there's more. This graceful secondary theme is accompanied by the ascending triad figure we heard from the main theme, which now becomes this in the bassoon. So we have that accompaniment with the lyrical secondary theme, like so. And 
you see how all these materials are bound together. They're related motivically in a subtle but organic sort of way. This is true symphonic writing. And this leads to the third major theme, also in G major. It's very energetic, almost boisterous in its precise clipped rhythms. <laughs> It's tough to do on the piano, but wait till you hear the strings play it. It is a brilliant, dashing theme. Now we have a minor key variant of the secondary theme, this one. Like so, in the cellos and basses. And it continues to wind its way back to G major to close out the exposition with a vigorous return of the main theme. a variation of it. And Beethoven now takes the rising triad, this thing, and inverts it using these chromatic diminished chord harmonies. Just for some extra added tension, leading back to G major for a brief and genteel closing. And the exposition ends emphatically in G major. So many amazing things bursting forth from Beethoven's mind. So here now is the exposition, beginning after the slow introduction, and I'll call out everything as it happens. Our main theme. It repeats in D minor. Now, a transition. those dynamic chords and a new theme with a downward scale. The main theme now has a transition and a connecting theme but also has a descending scale. And our secondary theme, we're now in G major. the ascending triad as accompaniment. And here is our third theme, bursting with energy. And here is the minor key version of the second theme. With an oboe obbligato, and the theme continues to wind its way in the cellos and basses. The main theme now. And the diminished chords, very intense. And a gentle closing in the dominant key of G major. And it will all repeat. It was standard practice to repeat the entire exposition so that the audience could hear all of the main materials again before plunging into the central development section. That's a fascinating way to look at the, the exposition of this symphony. Wow. Yeah, this may appear like um, a standard, um, you know, college music history lecture. Um, where you know you get acquainted with what's um, what the material is and uh, mm. how it's com you know comprised together to yeah. put into it. But um, I really love how Larry genuinely is enjoying the intricacies of the journey of the um, of the this construction of the the, the symphony, and uh, he makes it so alive. I know both you and me, Chris. Yeah. We went through the music history courses m multiple times, right? And um, a lot of it sometimes may, see may seem like, well, why do I ne even need to know it? Can I just enjoy the music, right? But uh, this builds up because um, it um, the exposition exposes the themes and yeah. these are like characters in the novel symphony can be compared to a novel so um if you pay attention to yeah. the details about the character as the characters as they appear in the first section of the novel first 
two, three hundred pages of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so then the <clears throat> the relationships and the development of the story starts making much more sense and uh, becomes a much more enriching reading experience. Same thing with the with the symphony. Um, it's uh, it's it's not just a you know sit back on your couch and enjoy kind of music. It's not a background music. It's a music which um, calls for active participation. How can you participate better in something? Well, by following the plot. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think it's um, really a s triumphant entrance of Beethoven as a composer to write not only in the key of C major, but also to introduce his character, his, his himself, um, within these sort of very boisterous, joyful and wonderful, um, optimistic themes that you hear uh, and it's all constructed in a really uh, perfect way I would say very masterful yeah. yeah everything links everything joins together so well and upon first hearing every theme seems to already be in its right place there's nothing that's a bit too long you know like uh, I think geometrically it's already really well crafted and structured and so it's just pure joy even so even listening to it again you because you do repeat the exposition as performance practice you don't find yourself oh here's that long exposition all over again it's this <laughs> idea yeah let's do it again and i think it's it you're right that we, if you think of a symphony as a novel um and 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 this kind of symphony is not a novel to be just trifled with and ignored. It's a really important statement by Beethoven. Yeah, it's not a paperback boulevard kind of novel. <laughs> no, it's not sort of like a summer read that you, you know, just it's it's a quick read and you don't really hold on to the characters. This is his first published symphony that he really wants to put a stamp on. And you think about how so many of his earlier works are in C major. It's almost as if it's preceding this sort of um, the stem, like how can I play with this key of C major and produce themes that are not only easy for the ear to latch onto. Um, I love the dominant, the leading note going into the tonic as in this, oh, here we go, you know, and then you had this descending, he uses scales, sort of as if a child is going up and down a slide or a roller coaster, and you get this sense that there is so much movement and yet there's a sense of mystery but also then when things come on it's very boisterous and he uses his third theme of a boisterous dashing theme to just give again more contrast so within the first two three minutes of the symphony you're already hooked to see what he's going to do i think it's amazing yeah totally and um the um great thing about this particular approach as Lawrence Rapchak does it um is it unveils the inner mechanics of how Beethoven created the symphony at mm. the same time is not overbearing with uh, too many technical details um i think it's uh, really something which um people can understand and relate to um even if they are not really you know musicians themselves um and not familiar with uh, too much t terminology he avoids um this elitist kind of terminology which is only access accessible to people who studied the subject and all of that um, and um, I, I really like how this um, opens up the possibility to relate to um, the Beethoven's creative process and um, his um, output as a constructor as an architect of his own um, music of his especially his symphonies it opens up and makes it accessible um, because you know we all say well classical music is so great why it's not just because it sounds good it's also because it really takes you on that roller coaster journey and how does it do it you, you got to build the roller coaster to start with then you can sell tickets right yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. that's exactly what beethoven did and then we can see how from symphony to symphony um that approach of his uh developed and became more and more um focused and, and you know more and more colors he was able to add instruments it's just incredible um exploration and research which Beethoven did and experimenting uh, all on the same 
outlook of building the symphony as opposed to just writing it um and uh, all these elements the con connecting those elements and they, yeah they flow and if you're doing something else and keeping beethoven on the background that's good too because it, it's yeah. just so um so harmonious and so well put together as we say right yeah. that it's not gonna um it, it's not gonna invade your life or just uh, dis disturb anything it's just gonna elevate your mood <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. I think with any great piece of art, there is always so much to be learned from how it's constructed and how it's crafted together in such a way that the more you know, it's not like it gets more boring or it loses its appeal or its shine. I think the more you know about Beethoven's music, the more you know about the symphony. And I've you know, conducted this first movement before and to listen to it again doesn't make me feel as if, oh, here we go. You know, I've heard this, been there, done that. It's actually just come more alive. It's music that somehow continues to live on. And I know this is very cliche for a lot of classical musicians. Oh, you know, this piece grows on you. This piece is maturing in you and you come to love it more as you grow. And I, I can't help but say that it is very true. And it's also sort of, I guess, like great pieces of music or great pieces of literature or great paintings that you revisit and you go and see again and it has a different way of appealing to you especially because of your life circumstances so to understand Beethoven and his first symphony as well as all the other symphonies that we've been doing so far and to have that sort of depth I'm sure if we had different conductors or different um, scholars talking about the symphonies again would learn something different but can they deliver it the way that Lawrence Raptor does not sure <laughs> but still it's just this idea that we can continue to learn and understand a different perspective of these symphonies and they don't cease to lose uh since it doesn't cease to have its appeal upon us and it continues to have that shine i think that's a really a great thing to be involved in yeah that's um a really great thing to own this possibility to connect with those masterpieces their yeah. masterpieces why because they really really rich in uh, what they um, in, in the goodies which they bring um, and that is uh, the, the on all levels on the level of feeling we perceive this music as just feel good music and uh, why because uh, as Lauren's pointing out it's made of the good elements <laughs> and well, it's constructed yeah. in a good harmonious way and at the same time you can step further and further in depth and learn more about the creator himself and the, mm. you know the beethoven and how he related and how he led his life and how he trans um, channeled his life events and his uh, life experience experiences into being creative now that's something anyone um, can relate to because we all yeah. have life experiences and we all have life circumstances and we all struggle just like Beethoven did with um, making our life obstacles into um, something other than the obstacle. Um, so this is, this is a good, I mean, you can go and peel that onion and go deeper and deeper in, in, in depth through this exploration yeah. and uh, find something which uh, will il il illuminate and elevate um, your day or the whole life. Yeah. What I love about this piece also, and I'm going to ask you a question after this, is also um, there's this incredible youthful joy to this piece of music um, and I think it obviously what makes Beethoven very interesting is that towards the end of his life towards the middle of his life there are different stages and there are different ways in which this optimism shows uh, my question would you for you would be what other piece in Beethoven's literature or works uh, would you say exudes this sense of um, optimism and dashing and movement and this forward drive oh tons there is a ton right. of yeah like it's, this it's sort, like this sort or this sort of idea of yeah br just absolute brilliance in a way yeah even in the later um years uh, in his like middle period he uh -huh. revisited the topic of um unrestricted unsuspended um immersion in joy over and over again well th think of the um the the, the aurora sonata this one yeah 
yeah, like, and that's already middle period, and um, and you know in the symphonies, uh, in the ninth symphony, the last movement, it's yes, not yes. it's not childish anymore, but it's just full of the same kind of um, unrestricted energy. It's like an avalanche of joy, um, and yeah. And you can just, that list goes on and on and on. Beethoven is a dramatic composer, but his um, his cast of drama, his type of his mm. menu of drama, is um, in, in that energy and the friction between um, tragedy and joy. And joy always wins. You know, Fifth Symphony ends up in yeah. in C major, uh, a pathetic um, ending. Yeah to all the struggles which were in the previous movement. So his that, direction is always upward. Yeah, and what I find is it's, he's never copying the same techniques to elicit this sort of joy or to portray this sort of joy. It's, he's always coming with very creative ways, whether it's these glissandies up and down in the last movement of that Volstein sonata that you just started to play in, or it, it could be um, this, you know, different rhythms in which he incorporates in the last uh, Opus 111 sonata, or with this um, idea of a constant Ode to Joy theme bursting through again and again with different accompaniment that just you feel like you feel like the whole world is about to explode. Um, I find it's it's brilliant that he doesn't just repeat himself. Mm -hmm. uh, that the mark of a great uh, craftsman is that he's able to reinvent. Uh, he's able to produce other ways to show this sort of joy and i think that's the more than this grumpy face that we always associate beethoven with i wish there was a portrait of him just absolutely ecstatic with energy and joy with like some shining light in his eyes true that's an interesting point you're making um the portraits and uh, you know his own writing letters the uh, uh, make him appear grumpy maybe that was um his just um, general and uh, impatience and life dissatisfaction that um yeah. the joy he was seeking in life um always was uh, a bit out of reach <laughs> yes, yes, yes. and as it is um but the the music really portrays a man um plowing through everything and going um 90 miles an hour towards that sunshine that's that's for me uh just the the, the inner nature of beethoven's music yeah. and probably his personality that's what i think and i think that's something that slowly reveals itself as you explore more of his music so you don't just think of Beethoven with his fifth symphony, you associate him with this incredible pastoral symphony of the sixth, you associate him with this symphony, and as you're following along, you may, you'll also probably explore the fourth symphony with us, and you'll find that there's amazing joy and bucolic um, life with nature, and I think that's what Beethoven really, there's so many sides of him, but I think this needs to be portrayed uh, more, so that it gives our listeners and us a sense that there is something to strive and yearn for, which is um, positive and good. And with yeah. that, I want to just thank our amazing team for putting again these videos for us and editing and putting these um, these cuts, these are ways way to see the see the music come alive, as well as um, the great people at New Media Productions, Virtual Concert Halls, Architects of Music, and of course, the narration of Larry Rapchak. Yes, thank you everyone collaborating with us. It's a great pleasure. And thank you the audience mm. for um, staying with us, for visiting yes. these um, pro pro programs and productions. And mm -hmm. um, as always, uh, we would like to encourage you to visit our website. And you can see them on the screen right now, going one after another. There's a lot of projects, of not only film projects, but also performances and broadcasts and uh, um, music, music and musicians from around the world, daily broadcasts. Mm where we bring uh, musicians and their projects and orchestras and various organizations to your attention. There is just so much wealth of great art out there and yeah. we want to bring it to everyone, make it accessible. So, And if you are a creator, visit our website, get in touch with us, uh, propose your project. We are very interested always to get in touch and to um, help and try collaborate. our best to collaborate and yeah, to make your dreams come true. <laughs> And yeah, as yeah. well as ours. <laughs> yes, and it's it's such a joy to be able to host and interview a lot of different people and to showcase art from all over the world. Uh, so I hope you'll be considering 
part of to be a part of our shows and with that we um want to thank you for joining us today this is part two of our beta and one documentary series and uh next up will be part three so i look forward to seeing you all there bye for now bye for now no matter where you are or who you are music connects us all we started with a dream but now we are paving the future welcome to the sound is perceiver global competition Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage.